Hi, I'm Miles Parker with the Eclipse Agent Modeling Platform, where I'm project lead, and also with Metascape, we do agent-based modeling tools and uh, provide consulting services. And so the first question to ask is why agent-based modeling at all? At all? And um, in order to answer that question, uh, let's start with an agent. And um, the first thing that we notice when we look at complex systems, and, and the world is made up of complex social and natural systems, is that there are a lot of pieces. And all of these parts um, have connections to each other. And those connections matter. And the connections matter not just across a population, but between scales. Well, second, when we look at these systems, um, there are ways that these agents interact with each other, and they do these. And these interactions occur in a lot of different ways. Um, and so, if we really want to understand these systems, we ought to have a way to understand how these interactions occur. If we look at what's going on with the polar ice caps, there's a lot of recent research. Um, about how uh, the chemistry and biology of coral, coral reefs is intimately tied in through uh, multi-scale interactions with uh, what's happening to those ice sheets. Finally, um, if we look at how um, we can understand these systems and make sense of them, um, we've had a lot of different ways of doing that traditionally. And, a lot of these, all of these really seem to involve taking these pieces and kind of sorting them out and figuring out how we can represent them at a higher level. Uh, you know, what's the uh, uh, average uh, income in the United States, for example? Those are the kinds of questions we try to answer. But then things begin to get a little more complicated. Uh, we find that there are different dimensions of data that matter. And so that starts leading us to ask more and more questions. Um, and so over time, scientists and mathematicians and so on have developed ways to deal with that. But then we get more dimensions and uh, more ways of looking at things. And these pieces get harder and harder to understand. and um, at some point, all of our attempts to fit these into traditional equation structures falls apart. Um, and in particular, we begin to see that uh, phenomena that we thought um, were predictable are um, inherently uh, having these inherently unpredictable qualities, these inherent qualities where um, some change somewhere uh, creates great change somewhere else. And, and in popular um, culture, we understand that now as, as the butterfly effect. Um, and, but this is key to so many, uh, so many natural systems. Um, if we look at uh, um, the Ross Ice Shelf, you know, which, which had has been around for a very long time and disappeared you know, literally in a, in a matter of uh, weeks and days. Okay, so we have um, these three different qualities, and I've chosen to refer to them this way, but people um, talk about them all kinds of different ways. Um, but this first one, again, is that there are lots of pieces, and the pieces are different, and the ways in which those pieces are different matters, and the fact that there are many, many pieces matter. We can't simply lump them all together and um, treat them as uh, kind of a blob um, that, that has these, these single characteristics. Um, and the, the, the behaviors that, that, that come from those um, that come from those different attributes matter. And that matters in the context of interdependence, which occurs across scales. And um, you can't really understand any particular scale of a system, say um, an animal population, without understanding um, the, the larger scale environment, say the climate that that animal exists in. And then at the lower level, understanding, um, say, how a uh, disease process might work within particular organ systems in that, um, in that animal. 
um, and that trying to uh, treat those um, as uh, trying to treat the different scales as something that you kind of kind of abstract away doesn't really work either. Um, and then finally, that the systems um, have this quality of um, we don't really know at from one moment exactly what's going to happen the next moment uh, because all of these sorts of interdependent interactions um, may pile up on each other in in unexpected ways and and. Um, trigger some new event. So in all of this, we need to be able to represent behavior. We need to be able to do this across scales. And we need to appreciate the importance of time and actually really model time as a disaggregate um, as well so that um, we can understand uh, how, these, um, how these sudden sort of interactions, uh, these sudden changes can occur. So if we're going to represent these in a, in a computational model, these are the kinds of things that we need to be able to do. Um, and these are the qualities that we see in agent-based models. We, we see heterogeneity, so each of our agents has different state. Um, and we see, again, this autonomy, where agents have these lists of behaviors, um, these, these sorts of behaviors that um, they're deciding on based on their uh, heterogeneous state. Um, bounded rationality is really important. This is the idea that agents are not perfect optimizers, that just like us, they're, they're in, in, in contrast to traditional, say, uh, uh, economics views, um, they're making decisions based on, um, you know, a set of rules that are, are sort of loose um, and based on prior experience and so on. These interactions between these agents occur in some kind of explicit space, um, and that doesn't need to be a physical space, but some kinds of interaction space. Um, that the interactions are themselves local, um, that there, we don't know everything that's happening in the world. We do know what's happening ar around us immediately, and we know um, the information we can get from um, people that we communicate with in, um, in social space and so on. Well, so far I've talked uh, in a lot of generalities. In the next uh, screencast, we'll look at how these principles will apply to a model of H1N1.